Okay, let's go ahead and uh, we'll start in chapter 5, verse 1, and just read through this and then come back to the, the notes that I've handed out for you. It says, Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the kings and his nobles, his wives, his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is the one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. And just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me, that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed in purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself, or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. O king, the most high God, granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of the beast, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven, uh, until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he sets it over whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. But you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, 
And you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But in the God whose hands are your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Mene, mene, tekel, ufarsin. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So as we look at this, I've kind of broken down some introductory notes here, and then we'll take a look at the outline of the book. Uh, first of all, when did this take place? Okay, so it's been a while since we have been in Daniel, uh, not just with our sharing the pulpit in Sunday school, but also with me being out for the past couple of weeks. Uh, so for us, it's been about six weeks. But when you look here from Daniel chapter 4, verse 37, to Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, uh, this takes place somewhere around mid-October in 539 B.C. And so that would put this about two decades after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, in Daniel 4, 37, we're not told that Nebuchadnezzar dies. We're not told when he dies in the book of Daniel. But when you take a look at um, all the historical data, this is about two decades after Nebuchadnezzar's death. So quite some time has passed between Daniel chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 5. And so what do we see taking place here? What's happening is that the, the Medo-Persian Empire, they have gathered together and they have been on the rise for some time. And they are about to take over Babylon. And so Belshazzar is having a feast. And while he's having a feast, um, we are told again from history uh, that the Medes and the Persians had surrounded Babylon. Uh, they had laid siege to this city. And uh, they come in, as we find out later on in chapter 5 towards the end, that that very night they took over and Belshazzar lost his life. And so this is what's happening. The city is under siege. Uh, Belshazzar understands that they are in grave danger. And so he holds a feast. He calls his nobles and he, he is uh, bringing in his wives and his concubines. And as we'll take a look here in a little more detail, uh, it really is this unholy feast. Unholy in the sense that uh, God is, is dishonored. Uh, the artifacts, the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem are being used to worship false gods. Uh, God's warnings and his grace from ages past with Nebuchadnezzar are being ignored, even though Belshazzar knows the facts. We understand that again from this chapter. So he's worshiping false gods. Uh, and then God, in a sense, attends the feast. We know that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere but uh, he makes his presence known with the handwriting on the wall. So this divine message is delivered to Belshazzar <coughs> in a very interesting and terrifying way. Uh, and then Daniel is called in once again, and Daniel gives the interpretation to the message. And once again, he demonstrates his humility. He demonstrates the fact that he knows that the only one who can answer these mysteries is the God in heaven, the one true God. And so Daniel is again called up, uh, by the king uh, to serve him through interpretation. Uh, he does just that and he gives all the glory to God. And then in the end, as we look at the last few verses, uh, this chapter really marks the end of the Babylonian Empire and the beginning of the Medo-Persian Empire as we read about it in the book of Daniel. And, and so this is, is uh, an ending to a world empire. Now it does not end the captivity for the Jews. That will continue. Uh, with the Medes and the Persians as they are in power, uh, but it does end Babylon's reign. And so as we look at the significance here, um, obviously we see there's a pride and humbling of a king. And, and so as we look at the humbling of Belshazzar specifically, we understand that the principles are the same for mankind in general. That man stands very proudful or prideful before God, very arrogant, and that God does not 
uh, overlook that pride. He deals with those who are proud. Sometimes that is dealt with in our lifetime. Uh, there are many who live very arrogant lives and uh, living in opposition to God for all their days. And uh, they might think that they get away with it, but in the end, God deals with all those who are proud and who oppose him. In this situation, he deals with Belshazzar and the entire nation uh, by bringing in the Medes and the Persians and that they put an end to his arrogance and his reign. We do see the faithfulness of God and his servant. This is something that we want to continue to see throughout the book of Daniel, is that there never is a situation where God is not in control. He is always orchestrating these events to bring about the glory of his name and the good of his people. And so in this situation, you have an empire that is crumbling, but you have the captives who are preserved, and in the end, uh, these Persian uh, leaders, uh, one specifically, as we'll read about that later, sends them back to Jerusalem, allows them to go back, not only allows them to go, but gives them all the supplies they need and security as they travel. And so God is orchestrating all these things, uh, even though Belshazzar and, and Daniel, all those involved at the time, may not see the big picture, but certainly God is being faithful to his word faithful to his people, and Daniel is demonstrating faithfulness. He, he is again coming to serve a pagan king, and uh, he could easily be self-serving. You know, he looks at the offer of what was uh, made from Belshazzar, of all the, the wealth and the power, and he says, I, I don't need that. That's not what I'm here. That's, that's not what I'm about. I'm not here for those things. Uh, you can give that to someone else. If you need answers from the Lord, the answers are free. I don't charge you for that. And so uh, we see here that Daniel is faithful in his ministry. We also see the confirmation of the accuracy of biblical prophecy. God had prophesied that the Jews would go into captivity. He prophesied their return. He prophesied the fall, the rise and fall of empires. And if you remember a few chapters back uh, with the, the image that, uh, of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, the head of gold, was Babylon, and then you have the chest, you have the next empire coming in. We see that with the Medes and the Persians. And so this is happening uh, right here before their eyes and before ours as we continue to read through Daniel. And so we have that reaffirmation that whatever God says is true. The prophecies he makes, the promises that he makes, they are all true. They, are, they either have been fulfilled or they will be fulfilled. And those that have not yet been fulfilled we can have assurance that they will be based on the 100% the accuracy track record of what we see in Scripture, where God is demonstrating that what he says comes to pass. And this is another example of that. So, uh, so who was Belshazzar? Uh, there is debate here, if you go on to that uh, second page on the inside. Uh, some say he was a son of Nebuchadnezzar. Some say he was a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And you'll find differing views in various commentaries. But there isn't any debate that he is a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it, it wouldn't be wrong if he was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson to say your father, Nebuchadnezzar. We talk about our forefathers. We talk about the founding fathers of our country or the fathers of our families. And so it wouldn't be wrong to refer to Nebuchadnezzar as his father if what they meant was, or what they understood was to his grandfather. And so either way, he was a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, his name uh, had great meaning, as, as all the names do, what we see here in Daniel. Uh, Belshazzar means Bel protect the king. And so there his name was calling upon the false gods, Bel in particular, to protect him. And so his name was a daily reminder of that. Uh, it was an interesting reign that he had. He wasn't the, the full outright king. He shared his power. In fact, uh, when you see in chapter 5, verse 7, uh, he says that um, any man who can, can give this interpretation would be third ruler in the kingdom. So that means there are two other rulers in the kingdom. One is Belshazzar, the other is Nabonidus. And so you have Belshazzar who is more the regent, Nabonidus is more the king. Nabonidus is out, he's not in the city at this time. Uh, Belshazzar is handling affairs there in the city. And uh, so in that order, Nabonidus, Belshazzar, Daniel then would have that third position of power in the kingdom of Babylon. Uh, he's a very prideful king, as I mentioned before, uh, and Daniel certainly calls that out. He knew the account of Nebuchadnezzar. 
We don't know uh, the exact details uh, of the extent of his knowledge, but he knew enough where Daniel says, you knew this, but you did not take heed. You did not humble yourself. And, and so we see there that Belshazzar is a very arrogant man. Uh, even though he saw God's work, in a sense, before his eyes, if whether Nebuchadnezzar with his father or his grandfather, to see a man of such great power, kind of at the height of the Babylonian Empire, be humbled by God and turned into this animal for years, and, and then to be restored to all his glory and more, I mean, that is a, a tremendous testimony of the God in heaven. And Belshazzar understood this. He knew the facts, he knew the details, but he did not take heed to the message. Uh, it kind of reminds me of, uh, take a look at 1 Corinthians 10, we'll come back uh, to this in just a bit. But it reminds me of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when as Paul is writing here to his uh, brethren in Corinth, he uses Israel as an example. And verses 1 through 11 talk about Israel's mistakes uh, when they were in the wilderness, that they were, um, uh, that, that what happened to them, verse 6 says, it happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. They became idolatrous, they grumbled against God, they grumbled against Moses. God sent serpents in to destroy them. 23,000 in one day fell. And then verse 11, Now these things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And then comes verse 12. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. And so Paul says, look, look at what happened to our ancestors. Look at what God did for them. Look at where he brought them. Look at where he was taking them, but look at how they treated God. Look at their example and don't follow that. What they did was ungodly and they paid the price for that. You, brethren, you need to take heed so that you don't fall as they fell in the wilderness. 23,000 in one day. And so Paul is giving them a very graphic example here that you need to humble yourselves. You need to lay down that pride Understand how small you are before God and avoid Israel's mistakes. Well, if you apply that same principle to Belshazzar, you know, centuries before, he had that example. He had that warning through Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel says it was a, a, enough revealed to you that you knew, yet you didn't take heed. He lived in his arrogance till the day he died. And he paid the price for that. Not just him, but the entire kingdom fell. And so you see here that uh, many times uh, the sins that we commit, uh, they don't stay confined. Uh, the, the, the consequence of that sin just to us, it can impact others. It has ripple effects many times. And here it applied to the entire kingdom. And so we see that here with um, Belshazzar, a very prideful king, and he ignored the obvious example uh, and warning that was given to him. And all those who knew Nebuchadnezzar, they saw God at work and he still ignored that warning. Well, here's how chapter 5 breaks down, and we'll pick up the pace here. Uh, in verses 1 through 4, we see this very prideful feast of Belshazzar. Uh, then we see in 5 through 9, God's message of judgment. Verses 10 through 16, Daniel is called to interpret the message. And then 17 through 28 is Daniel's interpretation with that reminder of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And then in verses 29 through 31, uh, Daniel is honored, but as we'll see, he probably didn't see a penny of that um, because Babylon fell that very night. And so the proclamation was made, but more than likely, Daniel didn't receive any of the promised wealth or glory uh, that um, Belshazzar said would come to him. So when we look at this prideful feast, again, we said the, the Medo-Persian Empire, was they were on the rise. And they had reached this tremendous level of power. They had laid siege to the city of Babylon. And, and so as they are here uh, attacking, if you look at verse 30, that same night, we'll kind of jump to the end, that same night Belshazzar the Chaldean king was slain. Okay? Now we don't see in chapter 5 anything that says the Medes and the Persians were surrounding here. There was X amount of troops around the city and they, they had them flanked. Or, we don't see that. But the fact that we find from history that this account is true, and we also see in chapter 5, verse 30, that that very night, 
Belshazzar was slain and Darius becomes king tells us that the Medes and Persians were right outside the gates. I mean, they were knocking on the gates in a sense. They were right there. And so what we find from extra biblical history, we can confirm and say that that does line up with scripture. The Medes and the Persians were out there waiting to take over. So Belshazzar was the king after them. Belshazzar was king after them. He was the second leader. So you have Nabonidus, who's not mentioned here, but history speaks of him. And then you have Belshazzar, who was the second in command. Whoever answered the interpretation would receive that position of third in power. Um, so you see that here. Uh, this feast is taking place. And, and what's probably happening here uh, is that Belshazzar is um, hoping for a couple of things to happen in this feast. One, maybe take the attention away from what's happening outside. Kind of boost morale. You know, when, when you are, if you're ever in a, a sporting event or, or some situation where things are stacked against you and you have people who are looking to you for leadership, uh, they, they are under your command, they're looking for direction, and you don't want the leaders to show any fear. You don't want them to show that uh, they are anxious or confused or they don't know what to do. Uh, here, perhaps this feast is, is uh, an attempt at boosting morale with all of the leaders, all those who are serving Belshazzar. Kind of like everything's normal, you know? But it wasn't, and you see that from their feast, they're calling upon the gods. Uh, they're calling upon the false gods, as Daniel says, they, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And so they're using these vessels from the temple. Vessels that had been created for holy use, they had been sanctified to serve the Lord in the temple, Nebuchadnezzar takes those when he invades Jerusalem years before, brings them back for use in Babylon, and so uh, Belshazzar takes these and uses them in his own pagan worship. And, and so you see how it's a very irreverent feast because it is taking those things that were intended to serve the one true God and they're being used in pagan worship. And, and so Belshazzar is, like I said, perhaps trying to uh, boost the spirits, the morale of his people, and also call upon the gods for deliverance. And so some commentators have suggested that maybe what was taking place was a drink offering. That's why he called for the vessels, the cups, and they were drinking from them, that they were somehow calling upon the gods using these um, holy items from the temple and, and looking for deliverance. And so that's where we see uh, the beginning of this event in chapter five. It's in the middle of a party, a feast, for thousands of his nobles, uh, with his wives and his concubines. Uh, verses 10 through 16, Daniel is called to interpret. I'm sorry, I missed uh, 5 through 9, the judgment. That's the big part of it, isn't it? <laughs> 5 through 9, this is a very interesting section. And I've seen a lot of artist renditions of what this looked like. And uh, we simply don't know. But uh, it says that Dan or Belshazzar saw the, the, the back of the hand. He saw this hand writing on the wall. And so there was some, some open area, maybe something like this behind me where it's kind of smooth and visible, or perhaps the back wall where you can look and see that there's enough room where, where anyone looking there could see this thing taking place. And so what's happening here is, is that God is uh, bringing his message of judgment. Uh, Belshazzar and his nobles are calling upon their gods for an answer, but the one true God answers in an amazing way. And so um, I, I have read a, uh, a book, I think it was by R.C. Sproul, and it had to do with, I believe, Joseph uh, in Genesis, and it was called The Invisible Hand. Have you seen that book? And it was talking about God's sovereign hand controlling all things. And after reading that, whenever I look at a, a situation where God's sovereignty is clearly in play, I think of the invisible hand of God. Well, here the invisible hand became visible. All the things that God was orchestrating from the time of the Jews' captivity uh, to Daniel's training and deliverance of his friends and, and as we'll see later, Daniel and the lion's den in the next chapter, all these events where God is kind of behind the scenes, unseen. He's present, but unseen. Uh, now he makes himself visible, uh, but only the hand. And obviously it's not God's hand. We know God is spirit. Uh, he doesn't possess a physical body. Um, but what he does is he manifests his presence there in the form of a human hand. It is recognizable to Belshazzar 
as a hand, and that hand is writing a message on that wall, a message of judgment. So there's a temporal fulfillment of all those events, you know, when you the fact that God's hand became visible, you know, think it's a fulfillment of those things, right? Well, I would definitely say that when you look at the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of the statue, that image, and how there was the head and the chest and the, the thighs and the legs and the feet, and each one with a different medal. And, and Daniel told him, this is the, the, the succession of empires. This is what's coming. You're the head, you're of gold, but there's another one coming after you. And so that prophecy was being fulfilled here. God was saying, you know, this is it. Your kingdom's divided. It's gonna be taken from you. And the next empire, that next portion of that image is coming, yeah. So that is definitely fulfillment uh, of that portion of the dream, yeah. And, and so you see here, um, Belshazzar sees this, and it says in verse 6, the king's face grew pale, his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. Joshua and I were talking about this the other day. He was reading through this for school, and he says, what does it mean his knees were knocking together? And so I kind of gave him a little, you know, a little uh, visual there, and I kind of had my knees shaking, and I said, have you ever been like so cold and maybe scared, you're kind of nervous, you're shaking, you kind of can't control, you know, yourself. He says, yeah, I've had this. This is what happened to Belshazzar, but like times 10. I mean, this guy was terrified. And Josh was, oh, I get it now. He was so scared that he like was, couldn't control himself. And that's exactly what's happening. He sees this image. I mean, he's been drinking. You have these invading armies outside the gates. He's calling on his gods with no answer from them, no message from them. And then he sees this man's hand appear in the middle of the feast and it's writing this message on the wall, and he is terrified. Uh, so that the hip joints go slack. I've had that happen. Uh, when I had back problems and pinch nerves, there were just times where I just kind of dropped and went limp. And so I'm, I'm kind of thinking, and I kind of know what Belshazzar is feeling here, where just his body's not responding well. He's so terrified by what he sees uh, that physically it, it impacts him. And uh, he, he is just weak, and he is, um, really dismayed by what's happening. And so like Nebuchadnezzar, he calls for the wise men. He calls for the experts. He says, hey, this situation is taking place. We have people outside the gates. We have this, this uh, message on the wall, this event that no one understands. I certainly don't get it. It's, I'm scared, silly. I need the, the, the experts to come in. And so he calls them in, the magicians, the conjurers, the, the Chaldeans, the diviners. And he makes the same promise. You give me the answer and you're going to be rewarded. Great wealth. And, and they cannot give the answer. Uh, verse eight is that summary. All the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Remember with Nebuchadnezzar, he wouldn't give them the dream itself. He didn't tell them the content of the dream. He says, you tell me the dream and the interpretation. He says, king, nobody can do that. We need to start somewhere. You gotta give us, you know, throw us a bone here. Well, here they had the inscription. Others saw it, it was fresh in Belshazzar's mind, and they come in and they cannot give the answer uh, to the king. So he becomes even more perplexed. And then the queen comes in, and uh, this queen uh, is probably the queen mother, not Belshazzar's wife, but perhaps a wife of Nebuchadnezzar who is still there that has influence in the kingdom. Uh, it, it doesn't seem that she is involved in this feast, She's not listed as one of the wives or concubines. It seems like she's outside of this, this gathering, and then she comes in. And so this is probably his mother, a woman who, who knew Nebuchadnezzar, who saw his humbling. <coughs> Certainly she knew Daniel. So she comes in, and she's giving counsel to the younger ruler, and, um, which is great. I mean, you, you, you have this arrogant young man, young compared to his mother, obviously, and... Uh, he can't figure out what's going on. He's lost the kingdom, and then here comes mom with words of wisdom. You know? And that happens so often in, in our families, right? I know I've had that, our, our kids have had that. I'm like, mom, I should have listened to you. How did you know? Well, because mom knows everything, right? But uh, so the queen mother comes in, and uh, as she comes in, she says, listen, there is a man named Daniel. You know, she greets him reverently, O king, live forever, verse 10. She says, don't be so terrified. Don't let your thoughts alarm you or your, your face be pale. There is a man who can give answers. This man's name is Daniel. He served Nebuchadnezzar well. He answered his 
dream. He gave the interpretation. In him, verse 12, is an extraordinary spirit. He has knowledge and insight of interpretations and dreams, explanation of enigmas, solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel. And so I would think that some of this is supernatural and other is the training he received. I mean, Daniel was a well-rounded man. He learned uh, the, the ways of the Babylonians. He applied that to his, his um, ministry, I guess we can call that, his authority, his position. And, and then the Lord would give him insight, would give him answers to these dreams. And so Daniel was a cut above the rest. And she says, you need to call on Daniel. He was able to do what none of the experts could do. And so that's exactly what happens as we look at verse um, 13 uh, through 16. Daniel comes in, and as he comes in, uh, the king speaks to him. Belshazzar speaks to him. Are, are you one of the exiles from Judah whom my father the king brought in? And he says, I've heard about you. I've heard about your extraordinary spirit. I heard about the wisdom, the insight. The wise men, they couldn't give me any answers. They were just here. I need you. You're, you're our last hope. And so I, I need you to do now what you did then. If what I heard about you is true, then, then make it happen right now. That's what he's asking for. And then you look at verse 17 through 28. Daniel interprets the message. But before he does that, he lets Belshazzar know exactly what's taking place here. And, and I love this. Daniel is not going to take any credit for this. He doesn't mince words. He gives Belshazzar exactly the message he needs to hear. He says, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. He says, I will give you the answer, but I don't want a reward. I'm not here for the money. God, you, you can't purchase God's wisdom. That's not the way it works. God has all the answers. His wisdom, his knowledge is free. He will reveal it to me, I will reveal it to you, you will have your answer, but I don't want a penny. You go ahead and reward someone else with these earthly treasures, but my wisdom comes from God and that wisdom doesn't come uh, at, at any price. You, you, no human can put a price tag on the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, is I will not accept it. And so we see there that, that free wisdom of God and Daniel's integrity, I, I'm not here to get wealthy uh, because of the word of God. And so he, he gives him that proper greeting. Verse 18, O King, the Most High God, right, granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. It says, remember, remember Nebuchadnezzar, father, grandfather, whoever he was, your ancestor, the king? Remember what happened to him? He was proud. He had everything. He had this vast kingdom. All the people, the nations, every language, they were all under his control. You look at verse 19, whomever he wished he killed and whomever he wished he spared. You see, he didn't have just the possession of the land, but he held people's lives in his very hands. He controlled the lives of his subjects. I mean, this man had tremendous power. But verse 20, when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and glory was taken away from him. That he just got too proud. He just would not stop in his acts of arrogance. In his mind, he was God. There was no one greater than Nebuchadnezzar in his own mind and God put a stop to that. God humbled him. He says, you knew this. Verse 21, he was driven away from mankind. His heart was made like that of beast. He dwelt with wild donkeys, he ate grass like cattle, his body was drenched, drenched with the dew of heaven. And all of this had a great purpose. If you look at all of that and say, why would God do this to Nebuchadnezzar? Here's why he did it. Until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he, the Most High God, sets it over whomever he wishes, even kings, even presidents prime ministers, governors, mayors, senators, representatives, whoever it is, pastors, leaders of businesses, right? God is the one who allows us to be elevated to those positions. And he expects us to honor him uh, in the proper manner, but Nebuchadnezzar did not. And so this was a lesson for Nebuchadnezzar and all those who knew what happened to him. 
Belshazzar knew what happened to him. And so verse 22, yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all this. Okay. He says, you're one of his descendants. You heard the stories. You knew what took place. You knew how he had everything taken from him, but you have not paid attention. You didn't heed the warning. Right? And if we could, you know, if, if Daniel had 1 Corinthians in his possession, he would have said, you didn't take heed, therefore you're going to fall. That's why I say when you look at this, I mean, written hundreds and hundreds of years later, but the principle is the same. The examples are there, the warnings are there. God reveals himself to mankind through scripture and, and through his prophets at the time, through these acts of, of, of miraculous events, and, and Belshazzar had the knowledge he needed, and yet he did not humble himself. And so he is going to be humbled by God. You know, and that is a very important thing that we need to understand as Christians, as humans in general, that if we do not humble ourselves before God, he will humble us before his throne. We will be humbled. We, humans, will be humbled before that judgment seat of Christ, that great white throne judgment. And anyone who thought they escaped this life of having to give God the glory that is due his name, they're going to be uh, humbled by Christ himself when he brings to, to light all the things that they have done, all of their rebellion against God, and then he casts them into the lake of fire. And so pride is never overlooked. You know, that, that is when you look at the fall of Satan, you look at the fall of Eve and Adam in the garden, pride is at the root of those rebellions. You look at Ezekiel 28, you won't go there for the sake of time, but Ezekiel 28 talks about the king of Tyre, then it talks about Satan, we believe, that, that power behind the king of Tyre. Certain references that are made to the king of Tyre that could only apply to someone uh, who was around before the king of Tyre existed. It says he was glorious, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, full of splendor and majesty at a position of great power, an anointed cherub. He was serving God. And then there was that day when he realized how magnificent he was and he was puffed up. He was filled with pride and, and evil filled him because he saw how wonderful he was and wanted to be equal to God. And God says, that's when you were cast out. You were profane and you were cast out. Satan's fall was pride. You look at Eve and she was guilty of, you know, the, the, the categorical sins that all man is guilty of, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. <clears throat> the fruit was desirable to make one wise. And Satan said, you will be just like God when you eat this fruit. That's why he doesn't want you to eat. He doesn't want any equals. So she took and she ate and then Adam also ate and here we are now paying the price for, for sin. And you look here with Belshazzar, you, you saw your arrogant father, Nebuchadnezzar, you saw what happened to him because of his pride, but you have not humbled yourself. You continued in your prideful ways, even though you had a, a tremendous warning before your eyes. And um, now, now you are being called to the carpet by God. He, he is going to hold you accountable for your arrogance. And so he says, you have not glorified him. You, you worship these gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood. They don't see, they don't hear, they don't understand but you've turned from the one God who does. And for that very reason, here's the message. So when you look here at verses 25 and following, mene, uh, mene, tekel, ufarsin. And so he breaks them down. When you look at this, uh, these were references to standard Babylonian weights, measures. Uh, archaeologists have found weights with these names inscribed on. You can read about that in, in, in uh, kind of biblical, historical books, archaeological um, um, articles, that they have found these very terms on their weights. And so the mina was 60 times the weight of the shekel, and, and perez can mean both half a shekel or half a mina. So perez denotes division. Okay? So if you have your mene mene tekel ufarsin, um, perez is the... Um, am I thinking of here? I'm losing my, my term there. Plural of that, it's, it's to divide, and so when you look at that, 
Bufarsen and Perez are not anything uh, that contradicts, but Perez means to divide, and so it's a term that is related to Bufarsen. And so when you see here uh, these, these terms, the, the mene mene, if you look now on the back side of this handout, uh, means counted or appointed. And to have it mentioned twice is the emphasis. You have been counted. You have been estimated by God. He's examined you. Okay? That's the first thing. Okay? Daniel's interpretation wasn't focused on literal weights and measures, but the spiritual measuring of a man. And so God looks at him, and Daniel says, here's the first portion of that message. You have been counted, and you've been found lacking. Okay? You, you don't measure up to God. Okay? Tekel means you are weighed or assessed. So God counts him, and then he weighs him, kind of on those divine scales. Right? You don't measure up to God. You don't meet his standard. And then Perez, divided. Okay? You've been counted, you've been weighed, you've been divided. Interesting that the next empire to come in, you know, when you look at Nebuchadnezzar's vision, uh, the statue, you have the head of gold, and then you have you know, the, the rest of the statue there. You have the different empires. You have the Babylonians, you have the Medes and the Persians, you have the Greeks, you have the Romans, and then what many believe is a, a revived Roman Empire with uh, other leaders involved, the Ten Toes. Interesting, the next, the next empire to come is a combined empire of the Medes and the Persians. And so the Medes and the Persians share the Babylonian Empire. And so here you've been counted, you've been weighed, and your kingdom has been divided between the Medes and the Persians. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this, God has been very clear in what's taking place. Uh, Babylon, their empire, was ending. Uh, and, and the Medes and the Persians were on the rise. Um, some commentators have suggested that there was some astrological significance here that the Chaldeans would have picked up on. Uh, when you look at when this was happening, uh, we would say this would have been right around the 16th of October in our calendars. Um, in the Babylonian calendar, it would have been on the 16th of uh, Tishrit. And Tishrit was linked to the constellation of the scales. We would call that Libra, if you follow the, um, the signs, those astrological signs. Uh, the scales, Libra, we, we call it, would make its first appearance in the night sky in the middle of the month. So if you would have looked up at the sky at that time when Babylon was taken over, you would see the scales in the sky. Okay? That would have been the season for those stars to be there, that constellation. And, and so, you know, if you look at that, and that is a legitimate connection, which it doesn't seem that it wouldn't be, uh, the Babylonian astrologers would have seen the significance there. After they heard the interpretation, counted, weighed, divided. This is all weights and measures, and we look up above us, right above are the scales. And, and it's right down in our kingdom. The heavens have counted us, and weighed us, and divided us. And so it's a message that they would not have missed. You know, we see that. Look at the last few verses here on the back side, the last um, section of this handout. Daniel's honor and Belshazzar's fall. So immediately after Daniel answered this mystery, Belshazzar gives orders. They put uh, uh, purple and uh, they clothed him in purple. They put a necklace of gold uh, around his neck. They issued the proclamation. It went out right then that he had authority as third ruler in the kingdom, but it didn't last very long. Belshazzar in verse 30 was slain that very night. And then Darius the Mede receives the kingdom at about the age of 62. And so whatever glory or honor Daniel had was short-lived. But he didn't want it anyway, so I don't think he was disappointed that it didn't last for very long. Um, and so Belshazzar, though, makes good on his promise, but uh, his reign, his life, is required of him that very night. Uh, interesting, there are different accounts of how the Babylonian uh, city fell. Uh, one account uh, that you find is that the Medo-Persian army uh, led by General Gubaru, diverted the waters of the Euphrates. Okay, the waters of the Euphrates River would flow under the walls to provide a source of water for the city. So they dug trenches, and then they diverted the water flow, so it, it lowered the water level, and they were able to walk under the walls without threat of drowning. 
And so history tells us that they took the city of Babylon without a fight. They marched right in that night under the walls and took the city and killed Belshazzar. There was no great battle for it. God had opened the door wide open for them to come right into the city and uh, they took over and history tells us that Babylon fell on October 16th, 539 BC. That was the end of the Babylonian Empire. So it was like a Pearl Harbor type of attack. Kind of. I mean, they came in under the radar. Nobody saw it coming and before they knew it was there, it was too late. Yeah. Um, but we would say not a shot was fired in this one. Yeah. Uh, you have here, um, you can take a look at these just for the sake of time, but you look at Isaiah 13, Isaiah 47, Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 51, Habakkuk 2, 5 through 19, uh, and, and the, the judgment that God promised was coming to Babylon had been fulfilled. And so again, it's confirmation uh, that God's promises are kept, that everything God says comes to pass. And uh, that brings the end of the Babylon, Babylonian Empire. Verse 31 now marks the, the beginning of a new section in Daniel. That's under the reign of Darius, of Darius the Mede. And so we're going to see here that Daniel continues to serve him, um, or, or continues to serve, but now he serves a different king. And uh, this doesn't end the captivity for the Jews. That's going to come a little later. A little later on, uh, after chapter 6, we see where the, the Jews, as far as the chronological um, break here, the Jews would go home and uh, one of these foreign kings will give them the uh, permission to go home, to give them the resources to go home and rebuild and to give them a, a letter to, to show that they come under the authority of the king and the protection of the king. He sent an envoy with them to make sure that uh, they were able to reach their land safely and to provide the resources. And so uh, this story is long from over. There's a lot that takes place. Chapter 6 will make a break for us next week, though. Chapter 6 kind of ends the historical account of the captivity. 7 through 12 focuses heavily on prophecy. So we're going to make a bit of a transition from the history of the captivity to the prophecies that Daniel received that were fulfilled um, both short-term and are yet to be fulfilled. So we'll see that uh, after 6. But next week, Daniel chapter 6 and that famous passage of Daniel in the lion's den. So. Let me close in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we come before you. We do thank you so much for this morning and for this chance to take a look at Daniel 5. We uh, pray that uh, we have learned a lesson this morning, even if it's a message that we have heard, a passage we have read many times. I pray that we would take it to heart, that we would understand, most of all, uh, that you hate pride, that pride goes before destruction, and that you are a God who will exalt the humble, but you will bring the prideful down. And uh, we pray, Lord, that each and every one of us have humbled ourselves before you at the cross of Christ and that we've received that salvation through him. We pray that we continue to be humble before you as your servants and never develop a self-righteous mentality and, and never look to our own wisdom and our own efforts and think that we don't need you. Uh, Father, we need you every day. We need you and, and your spirit within us and your son, as our advocate and your word before us, we need so many resources that you provide and uh, we simply cannot live without them. And uh, thank you for this reminder and we pray, Lord, that we'll use us uh, as examples in this community uh, with our neighbors and family and friends uh, of what it means to be humble for God and how people can have uh, that assurance that they will be accepted, not condemned by him, not judged if they come through Christ. We thank and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.